Uh, well, I, I first want to thank the Harry Bridges Center for in, inviting me here today. Um, it's funny because as I watched the video, this is what democracy looked like, I thought about, well, it was emotional for me, number one, but number two, it was uh, also thinking about my son who was a student here at the University of Washington at that time and helped lead uh, the organizing of the student contingent that marched downtown from the University of Washington to downtown on N30 and then he proceeded to participate. My daughter, who was a student at Garfield High School, was among the hundreds of students that walked out of Garfield High School that day and came downtown as well. Neither of them had ever witnessed anything like that in their life. That was seeing 30 to 50,000 people in the streets and recognizing the power that could exist when you get together, when you create the coalitions, when you figure out how you can find common ground and move forward together around a common vision of what you want, which is democracy, justice, peace, and economic security for everyone. I want to tell you a little bit about me before I go into the analysis that I have for you today. Um, so I started uh, my activism, as was mentioned, in the civil rights movement at Syracuse University. I came to Seattle in 1966. I became a leader of the Students for a Democratic Society on the campus at the University of Washington. I was suspended from the University of Washington in 1968 from our participation in a demonstration that involved throwing the recruiter from United Fruit off of the campus. We threw the recruiter from United Fruit off of the campus because of the role that they played in overthrowing the democratic government of Yomo Arbenz in Guatemala in 1954. And we thought that there was no place on the university for anyone representing a corporation that would come in and overthrow a democratic government who was just trying to return the land and resources of their people to the people. I stayed out of school for four years and participated full time in anti-war activity, anti-imperialism activity, came back to the U and completed law school in 73 and 74. Um, passed the bar but decided I didn't want to be a lawyer. I wanted to get involved in the labor movement. My reason for wanting to get involved in the labor movement was that I understood that the labor movement was one of the sectors of society that had the potential power to actually challenge the multinational corporate interests in this world. And I wanted to be in a place where I could be part of trying to challenge that power. My role in the WTO was not as one of the major leaders of what happened. Ron Judd, who you saw on the film, was the, co uh, the executive secretary of the King County Labor Council. And in terms of who led the labor part of the WTO activities over the four days, it was Ron Judd. And I want to say to you that the planning for what you saw happen on that day happened over a period of months. When we started out, we had no idea how many people were going to come to Seattle. Honestly, we just had no idea. And then all, and I'm sure you didn't either, Norm. Uh, <laughs> I, I, and, I would say that's true. <laughs> uh, and it was only over time that we recognized, holy shit, this is going to be really big. This is going to be amazing. Um, and so labor made the decision to hold, to begin the activities in Memorial Stadium uh, on Lower Queen Anne with a big rally. You heard the gentleman from the Bahamas speaking. He was speaking to that rally. We had probably 30,000 people. How many people here were at that, at that event? Let me see. Yeah, yeah, thank you. You're all veterans of that struggle. Um, we had about 30,000 people there. And I was asked to recruit the labor monitors, the security folks for that, and as, as well as um, to, I, I don't know if you recognize me, I've gotten a hell of a lot older, but also to lead some singing. Um, I was the one that was singing at the Steel 
Steelworkers Rally Power to the People. I had a beard and I had yeah. hair. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but, you know, but basically my major responsibility at the time was pr to provide the security at Memorial Stadium and in the march. Now I want to make clear that the command center was actually not there. The command center for the labor march, and I'm just going to give you a little bit of history that you don't see in the film. The actual command center for the labor march was in a car that was at the head of the march. Um, and uh, they were making the decisions about where the labor march was going to go after we left the stadium. We left the stadium knowing that there was a lot of activity going on downtown. We weren't fully aware of what was going on downtown at that time, nor were we fully aware of who was doing it. But I sure am proud of those young people that carried on that struggle downtown. They were absolutely amazing. So we began the march downtown, and in the command center, that is in that car, mm -hmm. along with the person who was hired to be the coordinator overall for the AFL-CIO march, um, the decision was taken that the labor march on that day would turn I forget what the name of the street is, is, but it would not go into downtown because they said that there was too much violence going on downtown and they felt like that we should not go there. Um, I was not particularly happy with that decision. So what I did is I asked a friend, Rich Feldman, who also worked for the labor movement, to please go downtown, scout it out, and decide if there really was a need to block the labor folks from walking downtown. Rich came back to me and said, no, there's no reason. People ought to go downtown. At that point, I was about halfway up in the march. I made the decision, Norm, to pull the monitors off, and we sent the labor people downtown. That's how we got downtown. Um, and that was at that point that the labor people decided that they were part of a much larger group that was out there demonstrating. And the identity between the folks from the labor movement, the more than 30,000 that were there, and the folks that were downtown, you know, uh, cuffed together, staying together, blocking streets, that identity began to form in a major way in that point as people went downtown and learned from each other. Now, I want to talk a little bit. I, I wasn't clear on what I was supposed to talk about today, Tyler. I apologize, but I want to talk a little bit about what I think is going to be ultimately the topic of the day, which is the militarization of the police. I think it's very important for us to distinguish between a riot and a rebellion. What you saw in downtown Seattle, what you're seeing in Ferguson, what we saw in the streets of Watts in the 1960s in Detroit and New York, was a rebellion, was people saying, we will not tolerate the injustices of these situations anymore, and we're going to fight back. Now, sometimes I think that some of those forms of rebellion can be stupid, but when people are angry, they don't always make the best decisions. But the point here is that these are not people who are out there doing something mindlessly or uh, taking action because somehow uh, they just want to be doing something. They're out there because they care about what our democracy is going to look like. Whether they are going to be able to send, uh, you know, I, I was listening to a speech yesterday by the national president of the AFL CIO, Richard Trumka. And he spoke in St. Louis in September of this year about what was going on in Ferguson before the decision uh, of the grand jury, which uh, uh, is inexcusable. But, but um, what he said was that we have to understand what it's like for a black parent who has a black son who is going to go out on the street some night, maybe go out with some friends somewhere. The fear that they have that their child may not return because they're black. That we as white workers and as a labor movement have to understand that, 
and have to act in solidarity with those parents because those fears are not irrational. They are quite rational. So what, what, what I want to say is that people get to a point where they feel like... I'm sorry. We're the AFL CIO leaders down in Ferguson. Well, I, I, my comrade John Rainey, a carpenter, went down to Ferguson and reported on his blog. So, is your goal to disrupt me? Is, I'm sorry. Is it your goal to disrupt my speech? There will be an opportunity for comments. I mean, you're certainly welcome to criticize me. I do know that the mother of Michael Brown was a UFCW member and a grocery worker. And there has been strong expressions of support from her for her from the labor movement. But I, I guess what I want to try and say to you all is that the reaction of the police back then during the WTO, during the rebellions of the 60s, was predictable. Because we have to understand what the role of the police is in our society. The role of the police in our society is to protect the interests of the, of the plutocrats. Now, that's not to say that's all they do. Obviously, there are times when the police help any and all of us. There are times when we need some assistance. But when you get down to the issue of rebellion and the issue of economic inequality in our society, and the desire, the justified desire of the majority, the vast majority of people to be able to share the wealth of this society, to be able to live, you know, with dignity and respect and without fear as a result of their color or as a result of their gender or as a result of their sexual orientation. When you get down to the fundamental challenges to the economic system, that allow the few to have a great amount and the many to have to share the rest. It is the job of the police to protect the interests of those who have. That is the reality and that is what we've seen throughout the world as well as in our own country. It's also what was, what was different about the WTO and very important, which we saw smatterings of in the 60s as well during the protests, is that for the most part, that kind of repression is aimed at communities of color and poor people. And what we saw during the WTO and during those other times I mentioned was that that repression was aimed at many middle-class white young people and others as well. And it was a lesson, it was an object lesson of how the state responds when there is a fundamental challenge to the economic system. Because have no doubt about it, the challenge of the WTO demonstrations and the battle in Seattle was a fundamental challenge to the economic system that the multinational corporations wanted to establish. Now, Working people have faced militarization in their struggle for dignity, respect, and a decent life throughout the history of the effort to build a labor movement in this country. Working people have had the guns turned on them when they organized their unions back in the latter part of the 19th century and the early part of the 20th century. That is the nature of the class system that we live in. So what is that level of repression designed to do? That level of repression is designed to make us fearful, to make us think that we can't change things. And what we can learn from the WTO is that if we are determined and if we are in solidarity with one another, we have the ability to make big changes. But the other thing we have to learn is that you can't have one battle and think the war is over. It goes on and on and on. Today, 
we're facing a similar kind of trade agreement with Trans-Pacific Partnership. How many of you know of the TPP? Let me see your hands. That's good. And how many of you are fighting to make sure, number one, that there's no fast-track approval of the TPP, and number two, prepared to fight to make sure that we don't have a TPP that, that helps the rich at the expense of everyone else in the world? Because that's what we're facing with the TPP and the Atlantic Partnership as well. It doesn't end there. The battle in Ferguson and the battle that's happening around the country is part of that battle, and it's ongoing. So it's not possible to sit down and rest on our laurels. I want to ask or advise any of you who have not yet had the opportunity to read the memo by Lewis Powell. Lewis Powell was the head of the American Chamber of Commerce, who in 1971 wrote a memo that became the Bible, basically, for corporate America. He wrote that memo because the 60s and 70s were so filled with democratic uprisings from the civil rights movement to the anti-war movement to the women's movement to the uh, environmental movement that those interests, those corporate interests felt like that they had lost control and they needed to reassert control. And they went to Lewis Powell who was a brilliant man. He wrote a brilliant memo. And Lewis Powell raised, uh, uh, laid out a blueprint for how they were going to reassert control in this country. I would urge any of you who have not yet read Lewis Powell's memo to read it. Because in that memo, you can see the game plan. Now, I'm going to tell you what it is. It's Lewis. I Googled it today just to make sure that I would tell you how to do it. All you got to do is Google Lewis Powell's memo, 1971. And it will come up and you'll see it. And Lewis Powell's memo laid out the blueprint for how corporate America was going to continue to attempt to assert control over this country and put down democratic movements. They were going to use their, their economic power to do it. It's very important that we understand how they operate in order for us to be able to know how we should operate. To many, the WTO was shocking in the level of force that was used against a predominantly white, many middle class mass of people. But to communities of color who rebelled in the 60s and remember the armed might of the state coming down on them, to those of us who remember the killings of Black Panther leaders, the tax squads beating up on protesters in the 60s and 70s, the response of the state to the ether efforts to either eliminate the WTO or make it responsive to the needs of the majority was not so much a shock, even though it was scary, which was what it was intended to be. I, I don't mean to demean the efforts to try and change the direction of those who challenge the dramatic militarization we are witnessing of our police force. It's important. It's part of fighting for a democracy. To challenge that trend is a fight for democracy. But I think that we have to have a bigger picture and understand if we're going to take on what we need to take on, we can expect that there's going to be significant repression, that we're going to have to go to jail, that there's going to be suffering, but that with the power of all of us together, we can achieve ultimately the kind of society we want to build. Thank you. Hi there, my name is Tyler Weaver, and as you heard, I'm an attorney. I'm the one person on the panel who wasn't actually involved in the events of WTO. I actually was not, I didn't even live in Seattle at the time. But early on in my career, uh, I came to work at a firm here in Seattle that does class actions. And one of the cases we had at that point was. That way? Oh, all right. Maybe it's not all right. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Is it working? Is this one working? Yeah. Closer. 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 All right. How about now? <laughs> All right. Uh, can people hear me in the back? Yeah. All right. So um, I was fortunate enough to, young, early in my career, to come to a firm that did class actions and already had a case pending uh, involving the arrests that happened, some of which you saw here on the, on the movie a few minutes ago. 
uh, involving uh, people who were surrounded and arrested by the police during the WTO protests. And um, I just want, so I, I basically had to come back and look at the events basically in a forensic thing to try to put it on at, at, at a trial, present it to a judge, and figure out exactly what had gone on. Uh, I watched, I watched this documentary, <laughs> I don't know how many times, we actually used some of it at trial. I uh, went back and looked at all sorts of news footage and basically archival mm -hmm. footage, listened to police tapes, and um, Norm can probably tell you what happened behind the scenes, but I want to tell you a little bit more, I want to talk to you a little bit about what I saw uh, as far as the police, what the police did, what actually happened in the WTO, and what I think might be the legacy, and what both the Seattle Police Department and other departments may have learned from this. Um, basically, they kind of alluded to this in the film, but essentially, the, the protests really started on a Tuesday in the week. There was a large demonstration of 50,000 people, in addition to other people who were already there. And they essentially took over the streets of downtown Seattle. There were some, a few people who were violent, but mostly it was large numbers of peaceful protests who were, uh, protesters who were in front of the doors of the convention center and uh, were basic, basically making it nearly impossible for the WTO to hold some uh, organized meetings. The response of the city and the mayor uh, and uh, a lesser extent Chief Stamper, but I, I don't know how involved you were in I, all this that went on. Maybe you can tell us, but um, essentially they uh, declared a roughly 30 block area of downtown off limits to protest uh, the next day. Uh, that meant that they had police around the perimeter of this area of downtown Seattle, the main core, business core, shopping core, who were uh, there to break protest signs, keep people out who uh, worked down that town but were having a, but had a no WTO uh, button on their chest, and to eventually arrest anybody who actually came down there to protest. Uh, one of my groups of clients, the ones we actually went to trial on behalf of, were a group of people who were basically marching through the streets peacefully within this no protest zone. Uh, they eventually ended up at Westlake Center. Uh, you saw some of that on the video. The guy with the dreadlocks was there at Westlake Center. Uh, the police scanner uh, indicated very clearly that the, the police recognized these people were peaceful. Uh, Lieutenant Whalen gave an order to, I mean, basically what he said on the police scanner was, they're entirely peaceful, they're headed into Westlake Park, let's surround them and arrest them. These people were surrounded completely by police, uh, about half of them on horseback, uh, and taken out one by one and put on the buses and taken off to Sandpoint. The other group of people I represented were the people who had started out the Steelworkers March and had then gone up into downtown outside the no protest zone and had then uh, basically been chased down First Avenue until they were blocked because the police were f afraid that they were going to head up into Queen Anne uh, up into the privileged neighborhood, <laughs> blocked them at First Avenue and Broad, in between Broad and Clay, basically surrounded them and arrested them, again, for basically running away from the police and trying to get away, not be arrested. Um, the reason I wanted to make sure you understood the no protest zone and the militarization was that the case I worked on took seven years because we had we originally lost, we went up on appeal, we came back down. Um, but during that time, while I was working on the case, I saw what happened in Seattle repeated time and time again in the news. Uh, as you know, in 2002, there was an arrest in Pershing Park in, w, in Washington, D.C. Uh, basically, uh, a 
hundreds of people surrounded and arrested in a public park in Washington, D.C. Uh, there was uh, a, a, trade, a trade protest in Miami in which, again, the, pro the police took the proactive action of preemptive arrests of surrounding people, arresting them. Again, in Boston in 2004 at the Democratic National Convention, they basically made protesters protest under a on-ramp, on a, or I guess it was a train uh, behind barbed wire. <laughs> uh, in, in New York in 2004, the, the, uh, the Republican Convention, we again had uh, an arrest of, I think it was, 1,800 people who were basically on the streets and the police again made preemptive arrests. And I don't know if the police actually get together and meet and exchange plans or not, uh, but it sure seems like there's a blueprint out there. I haven't seen it as much in recent years, but um, there is a blueprint which may or may not have started here in Seattle for how to deal with protests. And I think one of the lessons that we have, the police have learned is that when you're facing a large protest, it's better to arrest a lot of people before it gets out of control. And I can think of at least eight times, I listed off a lot of them, but I can think of at least eight times where I've seen that happen again in the country. Um, Seattle hasn't faced quite the same thing here, but um, honestly, after working with, against, and then later with the Seattle city, the city's attorneys and the police department, um, I'm not sure it wouldn't happen again here if there was a large enough gathering. Uh, I saw zero sense of remorse from the Seattle Police Department <laughs> about what had happened. Uh, about their violations of constitutional rights. Uh, the only reason we eventually settled the case because the city did, was not interested in showing any sign of uh, giving in to the protesters was when the, uh, we finally hit their excess insurance policy and the uh, excess insurer said, this is crazy, we have to, you know, we've got these people who were on buses and then in jail for four days and then charges were dropped against them. That's how, that's how they finally paid up. And I guess I want to close on that with kind of one of the things that happened in the trial, one of the more poignant moments of testimony. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Stanford testified at the trial, but I don't think you were there when Dr. or Lieutenant Whalen testified. Um, Lieutenant Whalen was the officer who had directed the arrests at Westlake Center. And we got him talking about the sort of weapons that they had used at the arrest. Uh, he started talking about, in particular, sting balls and flashbang grenade, flash grenades and uh, other various items they had used, as well as the sort of armor that the police used uh, during that arrest. And I remember sitting at the trial as he was going on and on, and he went on for some time. He did not have to be prompted um, about basically describing the police work that he did and the weapons that he used. Um, which were called non non lethal weapons because you know they they might really hurt somebody but they wouldn't kill somebody. But it really struck me um, that I sounded like I was talking. You know, we were hearing from a military officer, and uh, you know, for me personally, when I saw the footage and the photos from Ferguson, especially back in August, uh, and the police response. Uh, you know, Doc, Lieutenant Whalen came to mind and just the, uh, you know, remarkable similarities. People with, you know, tear gas guns standing over protesters and firing away at them. I, I, 
I don't know. I, I think we're going to hear more about the militarization and where it goes from here, but um, I, I hope, but I, I fear, I, I guess I fear that what the police took from WTO was how to do it better next time. Every time I face a new anniversary of the battle in Seattle, or see a new documentary, or revisit an older documentary, I am certainly taken back to those moments on the streets uh, of my city in, uh, in late 1999. And I don't care how many times I see it, I don't care how many times I read of it, uh, I'm affected at a very deep and emotional level. I gave a talk uh, at Town Hall, it was sponsored by Elliott Bay Books um, in, in the uh, early stages of a book tour. And at the end of my talk, in which I had in fact apologized to the people of Seattle, to my own police officers, uh, and certainly from visitors from throughout the globe, for my very poor leadership during that week, and for the biggest mistake of my career. I spent 34 years as a cop. I committed myself to certain principles and values and believed that I was on the right track and that the WTO protest, the globalization and anti-globalization conversation that, that uh, my mayor, Paul Schell, your mayor, if you happen to live in the city at that time, believed what happened, in other words, a conversation, a learning moment, an opportunity for people to see in sharp relief the effects of globalization, of corporate greed, of imperialism, of ab abuse of people in the workforce, on and on and on, and those who are advocating for globalization. The Lewis Powell letter, which is so strong and so important, I think, for every American to read, to really come face to face, in effect, with the enemy. And in any event, this was to have been a learning moment, and it was that. My problem and my concern is that we have not learned the lessons of WTO. I will confess here and now that when I gave that talk at Town Hall, I said, look, we had to clear that intersection on Tuesday morning, which for me was the catalytic marker event of the week. There's some footage here, of, you know, I can quarrel with the filmmaker, but it's a wonderful film of me talking about our restraint and so on and so forth. Uh, and at least the first glimpse of that was on the first day when people were coming up to me, protesters from our own local community, and thanking me and appreciating our officers for their restraint and for their professionalism, which all, of course, went completely south on Tuesday morning of that week. It was that decision that I regret more than any of my 34 years as a cop. So we did learn a lot. Uh, but for five years into my retirement, that book was published in 2005, um, I believed that we had no choice. I'm being completely honest with you when I say I believe that we needed to do what we did. So I made that statement and I offered a rationale for it. If we needed to get an aid car through to somebody who's bleeding on the other side of that intersection, if, we, if there was a fire, if there was a woman giving birth on the 27th floor of the Sheraton, for police reasons, we need this intersection. And of course, I have now come fully to the conclusion that that was nonsense. That there were any number of things that could have been done, including nothing, that would have produced a better outcome. So my deepest and most humble apologies. Thank you. I don't say that for you know, purposes of my soul cleansing or heart rending kind of confessional thing, but to say it is so sad that American law enforcement did not learn from my mistakes in 1999. I gave this talk, I want to return to this, at LA Bay, guy came up afterwards. I said, well, I got to get over there and start, start signing books. And 
And I was talking about 29 other subjects in addition to WTO and police militarization. But he came up to me and he said, I used to be proud to live in this city. I used to be proud that you were my police chief. And I am now ashamed of you. And I thought, well, nobody wants to hear that. <laughs> really, nobody wants to hear that. And I thought, God, you know, I, I'm, I'm really sorry that I've disappointed you, but I gotta tell you, I think we're gonna have to agree to disagree. We needed that intersection. I go on book tour, I hear from a lot of people in California, Oregon, uh, and certainly throughout Washington State. And I've given a talk at Kane Hall and I've had my come to Jesus moment. And I said that that was in fact the biggest mistake of my career. And after the Q&A in Kane Hall, I recognized this guy making his way <laughs> through the crowd. And he had tears in his eyes which I will admit produced some moisture in my own. And he said, you've restored my faith that we can in fact learn from these mistakes, but we've got to acknowledge them in the first place, which is hard to do if you're convinced that you own the streets. See, we regulate those streets day in and day out, those sidewalks. We regulate traffic. We engage in routine law enforcement policies and procedures and practices. And so when something truly special happens, namely the people of this country with visitors from around the globe <coughs> claim those streets, we should have in that moment acknowledged that the streets do in fact belong to the people. The police in America belong to the people, not the other way around. I believe that at some level, but I didn't feel it the way I feel it today. I fear for this country. I fear for every single young African-American male in particular who encounters far together too many police officers who lend credence to what you were talking about. I heard it in San Diego. I heard it in Seattle from African-American moms, middle-aged moms saying, my biggest fear is not that, that Eddie gets jumped into a gang, 12, 13 years old. My biggest fear is not that he does or deals drugs. My biggest fear is he's gonna meet one of you people one night and he's not gonna come home. Two moms, almost the same, expressed almost ver verbatim the same fear. And white cops who don't get that, who don't understand that, who don't go out of their way to open their hearts and particularly their minds, represent a real danger to their communities and ultimately to this country, to this society. The last thing I want to say is, as you suggested earlier, why would we expect anything else? This film makes much of the fact that 89% of police departments have a paramilitary uh, unit. <laughs> I'm sorry, but as somebody who spent 34 years as a cop, I will tell you every police department in this country has a paramilitary unit. It's called the police department. <laughs> it's paramilitary, it's bureaucratic, it has a rich and ugly tradition of protecting the moneyed and property rights of people throughout this country. That applies here in progressive Seattle. It applies in conservative San Diego. It applies from border to border and sea to sea. Paramilitary bureaucratic policing guarantees that we will see with absolutely predictable results the same reaction we saw in Ferguson. A cop sitting on top of an MRAP, mine resistant, ambush protected vehicle designed for war in Iraq and Afghanistan, wars that I think we truly do need to question, but designed for soldiers in wartime. And here they are 
policing the streets of an American city with a cop sitting on top with a sniper rifle. And by the way, pointing it at people. What has it come to? I hate these terms, no, no, no protest zone. I argued, no, well, it really wasn't a, a no <laughs> protest. It was, it was a curfew, it was done for emergency <laughs> purposes. And, and I'm happy to share the guilt and the blame uh, to get a declaration of emergency in need of mayor with a governor to bless it. So really, we all, that is to say the structure, the power structure of the city of Seattle and the state of Washington all colluded with that decision and I'm right there at the forefront of it. I think Paul Schell got a bad rap for WTO, by the way. I, he fumbled a lot and he stumbled a lot but in fact, it was on me. You are looking at the man who is responsible for the police tactics. It was not Paul Shell. may he rest in peace. I think he made some big mistakes that week. They were mostly mistakes that are internal and political. Um, and I told him so. <laughs> I said, well, never mind. I won't go there. <laughs> but I think, it's, I think it's vital that we understand that unless and until we are prepared an organized, mobilized, active community to confront police militarization by demanding an end or a major over, over, overhaul of the federal government's 1033 program, which provides military surplus to law enforcement. It's like from, from war fighting to drug fighting. And believe me, it's low-level, nonviolent drug offenders who are hit during those pre-dawn raids and their families and their pets. And oftentimes, wrong houses are hit on, on drug raids as a result of sloppy police work. So if we want to turn it around, in conclusion, I think it's going to have to come from an organized, mobilized, aroused, and informed citizenry insisting on an end to the militarization, insisting on transparency, uh, transparency and accountability that you get only through civilian oversight of local law enforcement policies and practices, it's not going to happen. I'm feeling pessimistic tonight. Tomorrow I may be a little more optimistic. Thank you.